Hi everybody and welcome to this documentary on Timeline. My name's Dan Snow and I want to tell you about History Hit TV. It's like the Netflix for history. Hundreds of exclusive documentaries and interviews with the world's best historians. We've got an exclusive offer available to fans of Timeline. If you go to History Hit TV, you can either follow the information below this video or just Google History Hit TV and use the code TIMELINE, you get a special introductory offer. Go and check it out. In the meantime, enjoy this video. Two world wars tore the heart out of the 20th century. They are a rent in the fabric of history. One world before, another after. Between these two tragedies, a mere 20 years. 20 years of peace that produced war. A peace that failed. Impossible peace. In four years of fighting, the First World War had claimed a life for every 25 seconds. And when the mincing machine stopped on November the 11th, 1918, the bill that had been run up was enormous. Great Britain lost 15% of her entire international wealth during the First World War. What had been the point of it all? Surely, it was that out of all the grief and loss would come a new world order. One in which peace and prosperity would replace inequality, injustice and dynastic swagger. For a long time, historians saw this moment as a sharp guillotine moment when um, the world pivoted from this terrible conflict to um, a new era. It wasn't as tidy as that. History is only interesting because nothing is inevitable. That the First World War would reverberate through two tumultuous decades, the 1920s and 30s, to re-emerge transformed and more deadly was not inevitable. But 20 years after the guns fell silent, they were again about their business. Louder and more lethal than ever. Why? Why did the peace that people prayed and paid for last little more than 20 years? Why did tyrants rise to control the fate of continents? Why did a world that had survived a war collapse into an unprecedented depression? Why was an age that nostalgia views enthusiastically as a time of jazz, prohibition, the talkies, the radio and the motor car, in reality an age of anxiety, when the underlying current was flowing towards disaster? The catalogue of questions of what ifs and why did theys starts with the first year of peace. At the beginning of the First World War, the United States owed Europe $4 billion. At the end, Europe owed the USA $10 billion. And America was making half of the world's manufactured goods. And this bright, shining shadow spread by the mass-producing, richly resourced, supremely powerful USA hung over the small states and old states of Europe. World War I really transformed the global economic system because it brought to an end the era of British free trade dominated international economy and introduced a much more autarkic international economy dominated by the United States. How were the old world states to avoid tumbling into insignificance? George V said, well, we've got nothing to worry about now. We are top dogs now, George V said. Um, a lovely phrase. 
In January 1919, against the wishes of the British cabinet minister responsible, the imperial government, the top dog in India, proposed extending its wartime emergency powers indefinitely. The result was popular and massive protest. The end of the First World War in India was a moment of great hope. Um, I mean, India had been a loyal uh, member of the British Empire and Imperial armies. Almost a million and a quarter Indian troops fought under the British flag in the First World War. In a few short months, cities were in an uproar. Local martial law was being imposed. In Punjab, sweeping preventative arrests sparked counter demonstrations in which five Europeans were murdered. Brigadier General Reginald Dyer was sent with 300 colonial troops to Amritsar, where in April, he faced a crowd of 20,000 which refused to disperse. So, Brigadier Dyer gave the order to open fire. The firing went on for 10 minutes, without answer from the unarmed crowd. After 10 minutes, 379 men, women and children were dead. Hundreds more were wounded. During the interwar period, most Americans disliked the British Empire. They saw it as a British heel on the necks of people all around the world. And this, of course, was not helped by the Amritsar massacre, which people rapidly learned about. The Secretary of State for India, Edwin Montague, presenting his report to the House of Commons, called the massacre at Amritsar a shameful act of racial humiliation and declared that Dyer was guilty of terrorism and Prussianism. In one of the British Parliament's less proud moments, Montague was shouted down by the Tory opposition with racist bluster and anti-Semitic remarks. The massacre at Amritsar in 1919 transformed the Indian national movement, both for the older, previously loyal generation and for the younger, radical uh, nationalists. They really felt one could no longer be loyal to the British imperial cause. Perversely, the British people remained loyal to the unrepentant Dyer. The London Morning Post opened a fund for the general, which, when it was closed, had raked in more than 26,000 pounds at a time when a skilled worker like a bricklayer was earning a little over 100 pounds a year. Other empires did not confront the challenge of a new world. They had not survived the war. The German Empire was gone. So too the Austro-Hungarian. The Russian had preceded them. The Ottoman followed. Within 48 hours of the Kaiser's flight, 25 German dynasties had abdicated. The breakup of all the empires, the breakup of the German Empire, breakup of the Ottoman Empire, breakup of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, you had 13 states that had not been states before. They didn't have financial systems. They didn't have central markets. They had to be created out of, out of wartime debris, one might also say. Germany had never had a functional democracy. The chancellor was made accountable to the Reichstag only two weeks before the armistice in the hope that peace talks would be found more congenial if the German delegates were representing a democracy. In Germany, the traditional elites were kicked out in 1918. Uh, aristocracy ended, the monarchy went, uh, the army was humbled, reduced to 100,000 men. And so the people who had maintained the kind of social and political stability before 1914 didn't disappear, but they lost that, that function. In Germany, the Social Democrats planned a parliamentary democracy, 
but they were obliged to share power with the Spartacists, who, led by Karl Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg, were intent on following the path of the Bolshevik Revolution. It seemed most likely that Germany, like Russia before it, would follow defeat with revolution. But the Freikorps, mainly ex-servicemen, homemade armies, as Richard Overy called them, murdered Liebknecht and Luxembourg and crushed the Spartacists on the streets of Berlin. After the elections, and because of the unrest in Berlin, the assembly met for the first time in the town in Thuringia that gave its name to the Republic, Weimar. Seventy-six percent of the electorate voted for the Weimar Republic. Fourteen years later, Almost the same proportion voted for the anti-democratic parties of right and left, whose only common cause was destruction of the Republic. The reason why they flipped is a fundamental motif of the interwar years. The Weimar political arrangement allowed for very small parties to make it past the post. And so that created this possibility that um, Either no coalition can be stable or that uh, an infinite number of coalitions in a way are possible um, and that no strong political force can really emerge. Russia went from Tsarist Empire to Communist Republic in nine months. Germany from authoritarian monarchy to parliamentary republic in nine days. Allowances should have been made. They went. The event of 1919 that would codify this new world order was the Peace Conference, a story of chaps and maps, in historian Zara Steiner's phrase. Had the newly elected German government been made part of the peace process, things might have gone differently, but it was not. The process was in the hands of Great Britain, France, Italy, and above all, the American president, Woodrow Wilson. A lot of Europeans wanted the same sorts of things that Woodrow Wilson was portraying. They wanted a better world because they had just seen what the war had done throughout Europe. In 1919, you get lots of demonstrations welcoming Wilson, people on the streets everywhere, thinking that this is a great new moment and opportunity for a new kind of world. So this sort of story of violence sits against the story of optimism and hope. In May 1919, British Prime Minister David Lloyd George remarked that, as long as America, England, and France stand together, we can keep the world from going to pieces. Well, perhaps he was right, but the three victorious powers could not stand together in any meaningful sense. They never had. Wilson was a neophyte in international negotiations, and he was pretty well played by the Allies uh, at Versailles. Uh, and he had a compromise on a number of things that he did not want to compromise on. The peace, which seems in the context a boundlessly unsuitable word, added a million square miles to Britain's empire and about a quarter of that to the French. In the carve-up of Central Europe, the peacemakers created a buffer zone, but it comprised unstable, uncertain states. The Baltic states, Poland, Czechoslovakia, a diminished Hungary, Yugoslavia, and it set them like a nut between the jaws of a cracker. It was hoped that the creation of this cordial sanitaire of small states would, sponge-like, absorb any leaking Bolshevism before it contaminated the waterways of the West. Lloyd George said it was a strategy which would not allow him to conceive any greater cause of future war. The division of Europe contrived at Versailles contained population anomalies 
that were to prove destabilizing. The American president looked at the map and preached self-determination. But in Europe, ethnicities and language groups had been crisscrossing the continent for centuries, and self-determination was a tricky principle to apply. The president had kicked a hornet's nest. Only 65% of the population of Poland was Polish. 51% of Czechoslovakians were Czech. And only 44% of Yugoslavians were from the ruling and dominant Serbs. The 13th of Wilson's 14 points stipulated that Poland should have free access to the sea, which could only be achieved by dividing East Prussia from the rest of Germany, which might have looked quite neat on a map. Infrastructurally, it was a major problem to create this new Polish state. Different judicial systems, uh, different currencies when they started. Even the, the railway system was, of course, the imperial railway system. So there was no connection, for example, between the main the capital, Warsaw, the new capital, and uh, uh, Lviv, one of the major cities, because this was in Austria. Hungary lost 75% of its territory and three million of its population at Versailles. Austria lost an empire. And Bulgaria, similarly punished for backing the wrong horse, lost territory and one million of its population. Woodrow Wilson placed great store in the idea of self-determination. But there was a conundrum. What should be done with Germany's former colonies? They were, after all, populated by what even the most enlightened called child races. One of the most extraordinary consequences of the 1919 settlement uh, was the mandate system, where the League of Nations mandated uh, the major powers, particularly Britain and France, to take over areas of the Ottoman Empire and former German colonies and so on. On January the 30th, 1919, the Supreme Council of the League agreed to the administration by advanced nations of those places inhabited by peoples not yet able to stand by themselves under the strenuous conditions of the modern world, whose well-being was a sacred trust of civilization. And so was self-determination a basic promise on President Wilson's agenda accommodated. The British expected it to mean that the child races could choose whose arms they rushed into and were alarmed. Mr. Spicer of the British Foreign Office said, we cannot hope to take into the British sphere all the peoples of the world who would doubtless like to enter into it. The Chinese expected it to mean that they would get back Germany's Chinese territory of Shandong. But astonishingly, they did not. China would hope to take back the previous um, concessions on the German control, was now um, given to Japan. So the anti-Japanese sentiment was rising as well as the nationalist sentiment. One of the consequences of the Paris Peace Conference in China was that it stimulated one of the most important student-driven political movements of the 20th century. One that actually gave rise to the birth of the Chinese Communist Party itself. And that took place on the 4th of May, 1919. Historian Susan Pedersen described the League's mandate system as a program perfectly tailored to the task of rehabilitating the imperial order at its moment of greatest disarray. Wilfred Scorn Blunt, poet, diplomat, explorer and amorist, deplored the idea of mandates. He was opposed to Britain spreading what he called its debased industrialism, its crude cookery, and its flavorless religious creed.
and the senescent British Empire did seem to be less top dog than baited bear. Nipped at by Ireland, Palestine, Iraq, India, Egypt, everywhere. Yet it remained the sole superpower as the USA withdrew into itself and Soviet Russia dealt with itself. One more illusion of an hallucinatory age. Writing Mein Kampf in 1923, Adolf Hitler would call the United Kingdom the greatest power on earth, which it was not. There's no doubt that the major global empires, uh, the British and the French Empire, very strong, they became larger after the end of the First World War. But in fact, that masked uh, fundamental weakness. They'd never really been prepared, either power, to put their money into defending those areas. Uh, they didn't seem to be a, a, a profound threat. Well, little girl, it is finished. The President of the United States of America wrote to his wife at the conclusion of the Versailles Peace Conference. And as no one is satisfied, it makes me hope we have made a just peace. But it is all in the lap of the gods. But of course it was not. It was in the laps of men. Including those who sat in the US Congress. President Wilson presented the text of the Versailles Treaty to the Senate on July the 10th. He said it was the hand of God who led us into this way. And he asked, dare we reject it and break the heart of the world? And the Senate answered, yes, we dare. I think there were probably sufficient swing votes in the Senate that had Wilson been able willing to compromise on some of these key issues, then he might well have got some sort of Senate, Senate agreement. Wilson tried to shift American public opinion on a whistle-stop tour, but the strain broke him. He took his campaign to the American people over the heads of Congress. He was going to persuade them by the force of his personality and the force of his ideals that this was going to be a good thing. And in the course of that, when he was in Colorado, he had severe headaches and a terrible stroke. When in November, the Senate put Versailles to the vote, rejected it, and spurned the League of Nations, the American president lay partially paralyzed in his bed. My own view is that the treaty probably could have got through. The United States could have joined the League of Nations, but it was defeated by a, co a combination of Republican intransigence and Wilson's own stubbornness. Now, if the United States had joined the League of Nations, we'll never know, but the history of the 1920s and 1930s might have been a bit different. On September the 12th, Gabriela D'Annunzio and 1,000 followers seized the humble Adriatic town of Fiume. Pledging to defend the city's Italian eater, against the whimsical decision of the peacemakers who had tossed it to the newly minted Yugoslavia. When writer and poet Osbert Sitwell visited Fiume, he thought there was a chance that Donuzio, this frail little genius, he called him, might create an ideal land where the arts might flourish, an alternative to the choice between Bolshevism and American capitalism. A young newspaper editor decided he would create the third way. His name was Benito Mussolini. And in November, he launched fascism. Fascism is indeed and has been spoken about by, by historians as a third way phenomenon. Now, what do we mean by this? I mean, essentially, it's a, it's a revolutionary movement from the right. And in that respect, it pits fascism against communism which is a revolution from the left. But of course, the really important X factor in the middle is the moribund um, liberal democracy. Like Hitler in 1923, Mussolini's first foray into politics was a humiliating failure. Both men proved to be resilient. 
Elsewhere, the ninth of 13 children, the most celebrated sportsman of the age. The Manassa Mauler, Jack Dempsey, was beating Jess Willard for the heavyweight crown. The 70,000 spectators pack around the ring in the blistering sunshine. So the big fight begins. The mahogany Hugh Dempsey circles, moving in and out with cat footed quickness. The champion lost a few teeth, suffered a broken jaw, broken cheekbone, and some broken ribs. The more powerful, but not the better man, won, said the Morning Herald. A slogan for the age. States only officially becomes an urban nation in 1920. And that simply means that more than 50% of Americans in 1920 are living in towns larger than 2,000 people. And given that low threshold, it's still a rural society. Its cities are big, but most Americans are still living rurally on farms or in small towns. Prohibition came to America on January the 16th, 1920. The first Prohibition Commissioner, John F. Kramer, confidently declaring that this law will be obeyed in cities large and small, and where it is not obeyed, it will be enforced. But enforcement relied on a small number of enforcement agents who paid $2,000 a year were not immune from temptation. Except for Isidore Einstein, who would sally forth with old friend Mo Smith. Equally unlikely, equally overweight, in any number of risible disguises to do battle with the bootleggers. The legend of the loved, feared, laughable Izzy and Mo was born. And a few more Izzy scattered over the country, wrote the Brooklyn Eagle, and the US would be bone dry, parched, and withered. 1920 was not a year when men like Izzy and Mo were appreciated. 1920 was a year when the world needed a drink. The impact of the worldwide depression of 1920 is widely understated. In Europe, Dr. Walter Rattenau Weimar Minister for Reconstruction and later for Finance was baffled. They write down noughts, and nine noughts means a milliard. But no one can imagine a milliard. Does a wood contain a milliard leaves? Are there a million blades of grass in a meadow? Who knows? When those responsible for a nation's economy don't know, and Rattenau was one such, there are bound to be problems and the where. Germany was struggling to adjust to a peace treaty in which she had lost all of her colonies, her main sources of coal, zinc, potash, and iron ore, 15% of her wheat crop, 18% of potato cultivation, and all German capital held abroad. She'd lost nine-tenths of her merchant fleet, which didn't just mean changing the flags on tramp steamers. Some of the most splendid ocean liners changed sides. The Imperator became Cunard's flagship Berengaria. The Bismarck sailed as the White Star Line's Majestic, and the Vaterland crossed the Atlantic as the Leviathan. Germany was also presented with a bill for reparations to pay the cost of the war. 
something that had been done over centuries. You'd make your enemy pay because you'd won, but the payment was classically fixed around the military cost. But the French and the British start to include all of these social costs, so they include the widows' pensions, which is something that always completely puzzled me when I was a student. I didn't understand why everybody was obsessed about these widows' pensions. Now I know, it's because it cost an absolute packet. On many important counts, Germany emerged better placed than Great Britain. Where the cost of living by late 1920 had reached three times its pre-war level, where inflation was 22%, unemployment was over 11%, and the highest ever recorded. And the debt was enormous and inescapable. Whereas, as historian Niall Ferguson has pointed out, the Germans were more successful than any other country in defaulting on their debts. In such a climate, the cost of maintaining what Gibbon, the great historian of empire called the arbitrary dominion of strangers, might have seemed prohibitive. But for France and Britain, the alternative to retreat from empire meant to surrender great power status. So they expanded their dominions. What is to become of the Ottoman Empire? Who is going to get which piece of, of, of that territorial pie, if you like? Britain was to get control of what we would recognize today as Iraq and Jordan. France was to get control of what we recognize today as Syria and Lebanon. Roughly the area that we recognize today as the occupied Palestinian territories and Israel was to become under the control of a sort of international condominium. They were not supposed to be colonies, but the practice was that the, the British and the French treated these places as if they were part of their empire and painted them pink and green on the map and so on. A road sign out in the desert tells us that 600 miles of burning sands are between here and romantic Baghdad. A Royal Air Force camp stands guard against raids by camel riders of the Arab tribes. When the Arab tribes threaten trouble, Winston Churchill, as Secretary of State for War and Air, sent a memo to Hugh Trenchard, head of the Royal Air Force. I think you should certainly proceed with the experimental work on gas bombs, Churchill wrote, especially mustard gas, which would inflict punishment on recalcitrant natives without inflicting grave injury. The expectation on the ground inside Egypt or Iraq or Syria is that they're on their way to nation statehood. But really, when you look at the British and the French, they don't see this happening anytime soon. On July the 24th, 1920, the Sharifian forces battled some 80,000 French, mainly colonial Senegalese and Moroccan troops on the plains of Maysalan outside Damascus. Supported by aircraft and artillery, the French crushed those who opposed them. King Faisal fled, and another step was taken in creating the tortured patchwork inheritance of the Middle East. The neighboring British sphere of influence was similarly convulsed and was only suppressed in November after extensive use of air power and at a cost of 40 million pounds. In 1920, to stabilize recalcitrant Iraq, the British sent in diplomat Sir Percy Cox, a man who could, it was said, keep silent in a dozen languages. Little wonder that in 1920, Photoplay magazine wrote an editorial imploring Charlie Chaplin to make a new film, because it said, we are doleful and bewildered in a doleful and bewildered world. Charlie Chaplin, who in 1914 is unknown, and by 1919 is the most famous person in the world, 
Many people have tried to explain the appeal of the little tramp. I think Chaplin, because of his musical experience, had a very good rapport. He understood what people would be amused by and what they would be moved by. The point about Chaplin was we would all like to kick the policeman. We would all like to kick the landlord. In the aftermath of the war, Italy had multiple changes of government. 1919 and 1920 were known as the Biennio Rosso, the two red years. This paralysis of the established order created an opportunity that was seized by the fasci. And it's a military term, it's about a bundle, it's also, it's, it's a formation of soldiers, a protective move of soldiers, becomes um, associated with a, with a movement, a street movement. It's only from 1919 onwards that we start talking about fascism as the political movement. Groups of fasci sprang up all over Italy. One, the Fasci de Combattimento, had been founded in 1919 by Benito Mussolini. Italy was unusual in having an advanced peasant trade union and after the First World War, it became for a while in 1919 and 1920, it, it managed to get quite a few gains in the pay and condition of Italian peasants. And fascism was designed to kill some of them, to give them castor oil, to humiliate them, to suppress people like that. Soviet Russia, meanwhile, and mistakenly, thought it would make a grab for lands lost when it made peace with Germany at Brest-Litovsk. But Poland was no pushover, and Piłsudski's counterattack on the 15th, 16th of August smashed into five Soviet armies, destroyed three of them, and continued the route until on August the 3rd, in Europe's last great cavalry battle, that's Most. 20,000 horsemen charged and countercharged in formation until the Polish Uhlans swept the field. Lenin sued for peace, and the Treaty of Riga was signed in March 1921. It was not to be a lasting peace. In Russia, the civil war that had been tearing at the nation since the Bolsheviks took power. At seven million, losses were four times greater than in the World War, was moving to a climax. The Russian civil wars were a very messy set of affairs with peasant uprisings, what we might call Greens, anarchist movements, blacks, anti-Russian nationalist movements. On the 20th of October, General Nikolai Yudinich was advancing into the suburbs of Petrograd, Demikin driving north towards Moscow, and Kolchak advancing out of Siberia. Had they been united in their purpose, Bolshevism would have been doomed. They were not, it was not. The ideology that the white movement formed was much weaker. They failed to communicate that ideology or their vision for the future of Russia uh, to the wider population as well as the Bolsheviks had. Trotsky managed to press two million men into the Red Army. By mid-November, the revolution had been saved. War, Trotsky said, is the locomotive of history. Amidst the conflict, urban life began to collapse quite quickly. Major cities began to depopulate at extraordinary rates. People flee the cities, return to rural areas where they think they've got a chance of eking out uh, a normal life. Lenin learned when he suppressed peasant unrest in 1921 that bullets do not fertilize the soil 
and terror does not make the wheat grow. In March, the new economic policy proved, if nothing else, that Lenin was pragmatist enough to correct his mistakes. A partial market economy was introduced, but it battled the cronyism and inefficiency that were already evident. By 1921, the Bolshevik bureaucracy was 10 times the size of the Tsars and employed twice as many people as Soviet industry. In America, a different sort of fighting was out on the streets, where Tommy guns cost about $3,000 each in today's money, fired 800 rounds a minute and became known as Chicago typewriters. Prohibition inflated the cost of drinking as much as 20-fold, and fortunes were made and paid out. Captain Bill McCoy ran Caribbean rum along the eastern seaboard. Just one of the rum runners, but a man who gifted his name to the English language because of the quality of his contraband. It was the real McCoy. The best known of the gang bosses to trade in bootleg, Al Capone, had business cards that described him as a second-hand furniture dealer and a real sense of himself as a leading citizen. In the Depression, he organized a Chicago soup kitchen that cost him $300 a day. It was legal for doctors to prescribe liquor for medicinal purposes, and in 1921, eight million gallons of uh, medicinal whiskey were withdrawn from federal warehouses. The most common ailment, according to Wags, was thirstitis. When it came to electing their president, this America, described as a country impatient of problems too weighty for the mind in the street, chose a man who shrank from problems which he knew to be beyond his powers. I don't seem to grasp that I am president, said President Warren Harding, who confessed, I don't know anything about the European stuff. Prohibition is here. And so is Warren Gamaliel Hardy, elected president by a record majority on the slogan, back to normalcy. There is no such word as normalcy, but the people want it just the same. America's conception of itself was still as a refuge from Europe. And when many Americans thought of Europe, they thought of uh, intrigue with aristocrats and monarchs and leading their countries into bad wars. And America's mission was to stand apart from all that. Modern America stood apart, some said on three pillars. The dollar, the movies, and jazz. Harlem's first jazz age hit was Shuffle Along, which featured an unknown Josephine Baker in the chorus. Jazz simply fit the times. The first great African-American poet, Langston Hughes, put it perfectly. The rhythm of life is a jazz rhythm, honey. The jazz age was boisterous, nervous, scandalous. In Hollywood, Scandal ended the career of a comedian whose popularity was second only to Chaplin's. A young actress died at a wild party. Roscoe Fatty Arbuckle was accused of her murder, tried and acquitted. One juror was moved to say that a gross injustice has been done to him. But the stories of how Virginia Rapp died persisted. 
fake news. And Fatty Arbuckle was finished. On October the 4th, 1921, the Permanent Mandates Commission of the League of Nations assembled in Geneva for its first session. Lord Curzon described the Middle East mandate as self-interest discreetly veiled by a facade of self-determination. During the Cairo conference of March 1921, Winston Churchill, colonial secretary by this stage, brings together um, military officials, colonial officials, interested parties to literally sit down over the course of a conference to put all of their ideas on paper and to come up with the arrangements that will become the boundaries that, that we recognise today. The British conceived a novel solution to the troubles in their Middle Eastern mandate. Iraq is probably the most artificial of all the states that are created. Essentially, they are lumping together three very distinct provinces of Baghdad, Basra and Mosul. Three provinces that have existed in the, in the Ottoman Empire but have never recognised themselves as um, affiliated in, in any sense. Britain essentially draws lines around those three provinces and says you, you are now a single nation state. The British offered the throne of Iraq to Faisal, recently tipped off the throne of Syria. On August the 23rd, 1921, Faisal was crowned king of Iraq. The war had been over for three years. The peacemakers had gone home. They had transformed the maps of Europe and the Middle East. In the Middle East, they had laid minefields and Europe was unsettled, perhaps in century. Fascist power was not in the parliament. It was with the squadristi, the gangs of paramilitary thugs whose violence bullied peasants and townspeople into surrender. But in 1921, as junior members of a bloc put together by Italian Prime Minister Giovanni Giolotti to check the rise of the left, they entered the Italian parliament. Of them, Giolotti said, the fascist candidates will be like fireworks. They will make a lot of noise, but will leave nothing behind except smoke. He was right, but they made more noise and for longer than he imagined. In August 1921, the Reparations Commission finally set the sum that Germany was required to pay. 226,000 million marks. The relationship between that announcement and the notorious hyperinflation that lay ahead was not the sum demanded, but the German government's plan for paying the bill, which was to print money. An astounding paper chase in which you got paid your wages and you rushed out to spend them as quickly as you could because by the time you got to the cafe where you were going to eat, they'd be worth half what they were when you were paid. Officially, there was repeated denial of the possible link between the profligate printing of money and inflation, leading historians to wonder whether these people were stupid or if they had a plan to bring on a crisis that might provoke the Allies into cancelling reparations. What they brought on was a rise of political extremism. In August, Adolf Hitler, member number 555, took over leadership of the National Socialist German Workers' Party. It makes no difference, Hitler said, whether they laugh at us or revile us. The main thing is that they mention us. And he set course towards an unimaginable cataclysm.